All right, uh, I think I'll keep us on, on track today. Um, so hello everyone, I'm Michael Maxey. I go by my last name. Uh, 4.5 million mics in America, if you believe Wikipedia, probably a couple in the room, so you can call me by my last name. Uh, I'm one of the LF Edge board members, um, so I work as part of the Linux Foundation Edge group. Uh, I also uh, work for Zadida, and today I have the privilege of presenting one of our customer case studies. So we'll be talking a little bit about Kubernetes, uh, running at the well site, uh, what are some of the challenges we've seen as we've sort of scaled our customers, and then some suggestions around those challenges. So hopefully you can leave us some ideas on you know, how to scale uh, in your environment. Uh, so uh, I do plan to leave some questions, some time for questions at the end, so hopefully we get some. Um, and with that, I'll, I'm gonna kick off. So, if you'd asked me about a year and a half ago what sort of the, the life cycle of an oil and gas field looks like, I'd say it's probably something like this, where you're out shooting for some food and like oil blows out of the ground, you buy a nice big mansion with a cement pond and you're off, off and running. Reality is it's something more along these lines. And, and this is a chart from, uh, I believe, Penn State University. Uh, and this shows sort of the life cycle of an oil well or an oil reservation. So what on the front end of that cycle is discovery. So this is when uh, you first find the well, there's some testing done, you do some initial drilling, and then you get that first ramp up to that green bar, uh, which is really full production. Uh, the green section is really um, gated by bandwidth of the downstream services. So it could be the size of the pipe flowing out of the well, it could be the the refinery downstream, but basically you're gated at a point, which is why it sort of flat lines in that green section, um, until a point where the well starts to deplete. And then it goes into this yellow section where you start to sort of be able to pump less out of the oil well at, at a particular time. Uh, so we actually have customers that sort of operate in both sets of those environments. Uh, in the green area, so this is in the reservoir management area, um, even though you're often um, gated by the downstream refinery or the, the, the pipes themselves, there is real work to be done. Um, the way it works is as you extract oil out of the ground, you need to replace that. It's often done with methane gas. So we're working with a partner that's using um, edge compute to really do two things in this production cycle. They have uh, computer vision cameras looking at sort of the burn off on the top of an oil well. So if you've ever driven by an oil well and you see a flame coming out of the top of it, what that is is methane gas burning off. Uh, they pump methane gas into the ground to force the oil out, but if you pump too much, um, you have to burn it off. It's bad for the environment, it's expensive, et cetera. If you don't pump enough, then the oil doesn't fill fast enough. So getting that, that ratio correct is really challenging. So we've uh, been working with customers where they're using a combination of sensors from uh, the well itself as well as the pipes and computer vision to sort of look at that flame and optimize methane pressure, right? So that's a way that you can sort of keep that green line at the top and continue to push oil through the system. Um, so that's one example. Uh, a second example, which I'm gonna spend a little bit more time on today is in that decline uh, part of the, the uh, well life cycle. So that's the yellow bar you see on this slide. Um, there are a number of sort of services companies that um, have really optimized this process. Like how do you extend that yellow? How do you, how do you pour, uh, extend the time that it, it, you can extract? Uh, and they do a lot of sort of custom work in the well. So in this particular example, we'll be talking about uh, this service provider drives a truck out to the well. So the well sites are wherever they may be, remote Texas in a lot of cases. Uh, they drop a probe down into the well itself. It's about a six foot metal probe that does seismic and radioactive and all sorts of sampling and testing uh, to pull data out of that particular well so they can look at the shape of the ground underneath and all the, all the details around it. And then they process that and, and give you, uh, or give the operator uh, best practices. It could be, you know, drill, drill at a different spot. It could be increased pressure. There's a lot of different things and techniques you can use to sort of extend the, the life of that yellow bar. Um, but they're doing that real time on the trucks. Um, and the technology stack looks something like this. Uh, so they're running uh, an edge server. Um, think of it as sort of a, uh, looks like a, a modem in your house, but it's fundamentally in this example, it's a pretty high powered Xeon box with GPUs in it. Uh, and on top of that, they're running uh, a couple software stacks. Um, at the bottom of that stack is Eve. I'll talk a little bit about Eve in a minute. It's an open source project. Uh, but on top of that, they have really two main applications running behind a firewall. 
Um, the first application is that legacy probe. So I talked about the six foot probe they put down into the well. That operates off a very old version of Windows. Uh, it's not something they're containerizing. Um, so that's something that you know, we see pretty common in edge environments is a lot of legacy. Not everything's been containerized. I think they're on a path to containerization, but you know, that, that virtual machine running Windows written by the guy in the 90s that everyone's afraid to touch is real. It's out there, and you have to run that alongside. And that's a pretty good example of that. Uh, that probe streams about a terabyte of data per day into a Kubernetes cluster. It's a K3S cluster where they're running some custom algorithms and some custom um, data transformations to uh, produce insight for the operators. So all of that's done locally on these trucks that roll out to the oil wells. Um, you know, historically, they've done this offline, so they would bring the data back to the, to the depot. They'd upload it to the cloud or to their private data center. they do an analytics there, and then when the truck rolled out again roughly a month later, they could then do the optimizations. So being able to do it like on the truck at the well site has brought them a ton of value and, and really allows them to kind of move faster by running uh, this mixed workload inside, inside this truck. Um, we see a lot of uh, firewalls, so commercial firewalls running on edge devices, as well as SD-WAN. Uh, people generally want to infer data, reduce data, something to that effect, and then push it back to a, a cloud instance or a private data center. So being able to manage all of those things at scale is, is a pretty common uh, use case for, for an edge compute platform like this. Um, I mentioned EVE. So um, EVE stands for Edge Virtualization Engine. It's an open source project. It lives in the LF Edge uh, Foundation. Um, it's Apache licensed. Uh, it is uh, a bare metal operating system really designed for edge workloads. So it runs on a really light footprint. Think about a half a gig of memory in a virtual CPU. Um, and it has a bunch of characteristics really designed for these types of workloads. Um, the first is uh, it it's runs a couple partitions, so when you do upgrades or when you change anything on the stack, you can always fail back to a known well state. Very important when your device is in the middle of nowhere and you don't want to send an IT person out there. Uh, it also includes an embedded hypervisor, so you can run all types of workloads, including Kubernetes clusters. Uh, and it has a really good security story for devices outside the data center. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about some of the challenges around um, scaling Kubernetes in these types of environments. Um, so, in general, um, this customer has uh, close to 1,000 of these garbage-looking trucks. Um, as I mentioned, they roll out in pairs to different oil wells, so they travel around quite a bit. So they're running this cluster, or that sample I showed you two slides ago, they're running that at scale across a bunch of different uh, trucks rolling out to remote environments. And as we've done uh, projects with this customer, uh, as well as some others, we've, we've sort of found, you know, sort of six or more challenges that you need to think about, need to address as you're thinking about scaling out to these types of, of locations and these types of small clusters. Uh, and we'll talk a little bit about each of them and, and some suggestions uh, around each of those as we go through this. Um, so the first one is distribution and features. Um, you know, so often we're seeing one node deployments, so running Kubernetes on a single node. Uh, you also support clustered nodes, so two and three as well, but you know, this particular customer runs on a single node, um, and as such, you, know, you can't run the entire CNCF ecosystem, right? Uh, Auto-scaling means less when you're running on a single server. Um, so fortunately, there's been a lot of work done around uh, smaller distributions. We heard Red Hat this morning talking about um, MicroShift. Uh, there's K3S, Minikube, K0S. I'm sure there's many that I'm missing. But there are a number of distributions that you can leverage which will really help with this. Um, the thing I would recommend is, is more than just choosing the right distribution, you have to think about the, the features and services that come with it. Right? If your application relies on a particular service, you're running Istio, as we saw in the previous example, you want to make sure this particular distribution either has that or has the capabilities to do that. So more than just selecting the right distribution, you have to think about your workload and your application and, and is it actually going to run well in these environments. Uh, but there's a lot of flexibility and, and scalability across these sort of uh, mini distributions and um, a bunch of flexibility to choose across different ones. Um, the second challenge has uh, been mentioned by, I think, every presenter so far, which is network suck, uh, especially at the edge. Um, so you need to think about, like, 
how do you how do you administer that cluster, right? How do you deal with updates? Um, and we'll talk a minute about sort of people costs. Uh, certainly, you can send people to these sites, but it's usually a helicopter ride and pretty expensive. So you need to be able to operate in a model that really supports these distributed networks that aren't there. Um, beyond unreliable, they're often um, not made public to the internet. Um, these companies don't want to put their assets on the internet, right? So you have to deal with egress proxies or deal with uh, VPN connections or, or have some sort of way to get into these devices um, through either standard networking or, or through a, a system sort of built for it. Um, you know, the techniques we've seen that work well, um, eventual consistency model. So rather than a command and control architecture where you're trying to log into a node that doesn't have a network connection, you have the node be more autonomous, pull down configuration and operate on its own. Uh, so that's a, a, a pattern we've seen that's implemented as part of EVE, but is also a pattern you've seen in networking and lots of other sort of verticals around uh, trouble with connectivity and a pretty well-run uh, way to operate your system. Um, alternatives are, you know, you sort of bake the system and leave it. Um, you know, if, if you plan uh, truck rolls, as they're called in this industry, which is when you send an IT guy out once a quarter or once every six months to update your software, that's an approach. It works. Um, you can do the same with Kubernetes. Uh, we've also seen local orchestrators, um, so beating the network by being on the network, uh, but this also um, requires someone that can operate it, that can use that orchestration, that can push new workloads, um, so that sometimes bounces against uh, headcount costs and people costs. Uh, but there are techniques. It is possible, but just keep in mind um, you're not going to necessarily be able to Cube connect to all of these clusters when you want to. Um, so you have to think about sort of the networking. Uh, a third is uh, security threat vectors. Um, so these devices are often in the wild. They're running in retail stores. They're running in um, uh, dealer, car dealerships, oil wells. They go missing. People plug USBs into them. Um, so beyond just the Kubernetes cluster and sort of the network access to the cluster, you have to think about the physical device. You know, are you turning off all the ports? Are you making sure your OS boots first? If someone boots in front of you and hits the TPM, like bad things can happen. So you want to think about that threat vectors beyond the data center. You taking these out, you know, have long, you know, longer have arm guards, those sorts of things. So you need to, you know, establish the device as your device using hardware root of trust. You need to shut off all the ports, shut off all the connectivity. Um, you know, and then on top of that, you want to do the stuff you do in the data center as well. So you're going to want to run an advanced firewall, uh, potentially AI to monitor the workflow. And is it changing? Is somebody sort of hacking into your runtime? Um, so there is a bit of a security um, expansion you need to think about. But you can also bring a bunch of the techniques you're already doing from your data center or cloud into that environment. So just some more areas to think about, like theft of devices, physical access, uh, turning off ports, connectivity, all those sorts of things are really important when you're out on the edge. Um, interoperability and hardware diversity. Um, you know, so lots of different stuff out there. Um, everything from Raspberry Pis up to pretty powerful servers running in a sort of in, uh, explosion proof box. Um, diversity also includes networks, so you're going to need to support LTE, uh, maybe failover to satellite, depending on your connectivity. Um, so having uh, a, a distribution, an operating system that can cover all of that diversity is super important. Uh, it also allows you know, um, the end users to select the right hardware. So if it costs as a component, which it always is, a good place to optimize is hardware as long as your operating system and, and cluster can run on top of that. Um, and then in terms of software diversity, um, you know, edge continues to grow. It continues to be an exploding market, but it's super bespoke. Everybody has their favorite stack. Everybody has their favorite uh, database or, or data technology. Um, so being able to handle a lot of interoperability is a really important piece of the solution as well. So think about like, what do you want to do today? How is that going to evolve over time? What new potential applications are going to come on top of that? Because these devices live roughly 10 years in the field. You deploy this piece of hardware, it's going to be there for 10 years. So you're going to want to think about your software lifecycle beyond you know, 12 months or, or beyond sort of the, the standard two to three years. You really want to think about a long lifecycle of diversity. Um, 
which can also lead to sort of over-provisioning. So we've seen customers kind of buy a much bigger system than they probably need today, knowing that you know, 10 years from now, it's still gonna be out there and still gonna need to operate. In terms of uh, the fifth challenge, so people. People are always the worst part of a system. Uh, most of the mistakes happen there. But beyond that, um, you know, operating Kubernetes and, and having that expertise is it's a sought after technology, right? People want to hire these people. Um, they're expensive. They're especially expensive when you ask them to go to remote Texas. Not everybody wants to live in remote Texas or in um, the Middle East. So people costs can be huge. So anything you can do to prevent a truck roll, to prevent a human from having to go to this edge site can save you a lot of money. Um, you've seen techniques, um, things like measured boot. So very similar to secure boot, but measured boot allows you to sort of act, it, uh, act on the device if something bad shows up, it doesn't brick the device. Um, you know, canary upgrades, doing backup and recovery, things you'd expect. Uh, but anything you can really to prevent people from having to go to this edge site, because that's the number one cost in edge computing is really the people side of this. Um, so there's a lot of techniques you can do around that. Um, Kubernetes obviously has a great tool set to help with that as well. So as you sort of move up stack into Kubernetes, um, you know, these techniques are pretty well known and, and pretty well uh, managed at this point. So that's why Kubernetes is a good fit. And then uh, sort of my last um, challenge is probably the hardest which is, you know, the, the Kubernetes is pretty well designed to support a single cluster with a thousand nodes or more. Um, but when you have thousands of clusters with one or two nodes, it's a very different management par paradigm. Um, and, you know, I, I built this chart to sort of help guide folks on which direction to run. Um, you know, I think to some extent, uh, it, it depends on like how deep into Kubernetes are you using it and, and what is the skill set in your shop. If you have um, good expertise in your shop and you have, you're using some core features of Kubernetes, then a small K3S instance on the edge probably makes sense. And it scales just fine to a certain point where the orchestrators start to schedule. And that can be, you know, uh, as small as less than a thousand sites where these orchestrators start to start to have issues. So there is a pure Kubernetes approach. Uh, works really well if you have the right, the right sort of team inside, you need the right features and you have the right scale. Um, the other approach, sort of the green area on this chart is um, leveraging Kubernetes maybe for cloud, but you know, picking up maybe a Helm chart or uh, some sort of output that comes out of your Kubernetes workflow and applying it to a different edge engine. So we heard uh, Red Hat this morning talk about um, using the um, uh, or the um, using Docker or using Podman, for example, as a way to deploy. Uh, there's commercial solutions out there. Um, Avasa, for example, uh, IBM has an open source solution in Open Horizon. Uh, there's a number of sort of edge native. Uh, container orchestration systems that can consume a Helm chart or consume a, a, a Kubernetes API, but actually deploy on something other than Kubernetes. So if you're running a handful of, of containers and you, know, you want to go to 10,000 sites or 50,000 sites, K3S might not be the right solution for you. You might want to do sort of a hybrid solution. Now, and if you fall into sort of that gray area where you are sort of deep into Kubernetes, but you have sites you know, in the many thousands, you know, that's an area that, you know, a lot of work going on, but not well solved, right? So that's an area where we just sort of say, let's talk about it. Let's see what you really need to do there. Um, I think this is an area where as a community, um, Kubernetes is gonna start to evolve and, and, and really start to bring some value is, you know, how you deal with hundreds or even thousands of really small clusters. It's a very different workload. These things flap in and out as networks go up and down and, you know, orchestrating that is, an order of magnitude different than what these things were built for. So that's an area where, you know, it's kind of bleeding edge. We do have customers, um, you know, pushing tens of thousands of single node clusters. They're sharding their um, rancher instances so that they can start to hit that scale. But even that will break at some point. Um, so this is an area where I think as an industry, we can come together and start to think about like, how do we really solve for this, you know, true Kubernetes runtime scaling beyond, you know, one to 2,000 types of devices. 
Um, so hopefully those helped, some considerations to think through. Um, there's a feedback QR code. Would love some feedback on this presentation. Um, I also have time for questions. I have about five minutes, so would love some questions if there's any in the audience. Harry, I know you always have questions. Yes. So I believe the question was, have we seen anyone try to use namespaces across clusters to cover the distributed nature of it? Is that a fair? Well, trying to treat all their customers as one big cluster. All their customers as one big cluster. No, we haven't. Um, primarily because of connectivity is challenging around that. Um, when nodes drop in and out, it, it's difficult at scale when you're running a couple thousands of those. So, we have seen like an Uber orchestrator that manages lots of individual clusters, but not one gigantic, say, 3,000 node cluster in 2,000 locations. That's not something we've seen people be successful with. Good question, though. Thank you. All right. Well, I appreciate everybody's time. Thank you.